he was out uh, uh, uh. so and uh, welcome all of you to another enriching lecture of our cultural studies research forum and today we have with us our beloved ma'am our all everything is kalani ma'am and um, i i would like to call sandeep sir please come and just make me amazed uh, with introductory speech of yours by uh, for kalani ma'am thank you thank you koel good evening we are friends happy dasara and shubha vijaya to all of you welcome to the 10th lecture of cultural studies research forum csrf is a non profit enterprise started by walat tes largely operated by student initiatives we aim to promote free public lectures discussions on various aspects of research and to increase the awareness of cultural studies among students tonight we are privileged to delve into the intricate tapestry of contemporary american literature a realm where the line between guilty pleasure and exhaustion blur and where our deepest emotions and societal reflection come to life in an age of instant gratification this term guilty pleasure has become synonymous with indulgences we enjoy but might not openly admit to in literature we find it in uh, romance novels thrillers and even certain uh, young adult fictions they offer escape fantasy and a break from the mundane on the other end of this spectrum we find tales of exhaustion these narratives open depict characters grappling with the demands of modern lives the hustle culture and the societal pressure guilty pleasure can be a response to it as we does we oscillate between seeking comfort in guilty pleasure and confronting the realities of exhaustion it challenges us to the questions like why do we feel guilty about our own pleasure and how can we navigate the overwhelming tide of modern life without losing ourselves let us find the answer in tonight's lecture by someone who used to be a scholar from the university of british columbia she is not just an expert but a passionate advocate of understanding the undercurrents of literature and its reflection on society she has spent her time studying analyzing and teaching english literature for around 3 decades now she has delivered lectures with particular focus on themes that resonate with our modern experiences in hundreds of colleges and universities in india and abroad even in prestigious institutions like the university of oxford in more than one occasions being the editor in chief of the two volumes of the encyclopedia of the literature of the americas she is perhaps the most suitable person to enlighten us with this topic dear friends let's start our enlightening journey please join me in giving a warm welcome to our respected speaker dr kalani wala the ceo of wala education private limited please ma'am thank you sandeep uh like sandeep said this american literature is a mind boggling ocean well in our, our syllabi and our exams it looks like there is a a weightage given to british literature post colonial literatures criticism and theory and many people are under the impression that uh, american literature is not very important for competitive exams but that is not so because american literature is about theory 
It is about diasporic literature. It is about trauma. It is about post-humanism. So many other discourses that we have in our syllabi, in our exams, in our pursuit of uh, intellectual pursuit of literature studies border on American literature, even linguistics. Linguistics also largely developed in America. So American literature is of great importance uh, to understand contemporary culture also because the entire world is Americanized. What we call world literature is an Americanized form of literature. So that is why I thought after British Literature Encyclopedia, we will bring out the American Literature Encyclopedia. Yes, this lecture is on American literature because I have been working with these topics for the past many months and years now with the help of the coordinators of the CSR of itself. They are all part of my team. And uh, that is why I thought I will introduce to you this amazing ocean of uh, literature America, in, in America. But a two hour or one hour lecture will not do justice to it. I will only be able to tell you a few strands or a few contemporary trends. I cannot hope to uh, encompass everything in American literature into this lecture. And also just because we made this encyclopedia, that also does not mean I am an expert on all aspects of American literature or anything. Like you, I'm a student uh, on the banks of this ocean trying to make sense of it. So let me share with you my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I have given a very cheesy title, uh, Guilty Pleasure and Exhaustion, an overview of contemporary American literature. This presentation that I have here is provocatively uh, cheesy, but it is not in content provocative or uh, bordering on guilt or pleasure of any sort. I hope it will not be exhaustive either. Um, we will see what it means when I titled it Guilty Pleasure and Exhaustion. You can wait uh, until I go into it. As you know, today I was... Uh, talking to my husband and saying how diverse India is. India is so diverse. And then we were wondering, is there any other country that is as diverse as India? And uh, we reached the conclusion, perhaps not, because so many languages and cultures and histories bring, coming together into one nation. If there is one nation where you can talk about diversity as much as there is in India, it is the United States. It is one of the most diverse nations with the 3 million population uh, involving 30 million foreign born individuals, including those from India, Asia and Latin America. So the literature of United States is also therefore dazzlingly diverse, so enriching, exciting and also continuously evolving. As I'm speaking, and as you are listening to me, I'm sure there are new genres coming into being. There are new ways of uh, narration and visualization happening because of the exponential growth of technology also. The voices of American literature rise from all quarters. There are all kinds of writers from the rich and the poor, from the center and the margin, from all socioeconomic backgrounds, Previously underdeveloped and underrepresented groups have begun to express themselves more fully now, while technological innovations have created a yes. fast moving uh, public sphere. It is all out there in the open for us to see, and they're all being adapted into movies, uh, all posted in the internet. There are many reading clubs, book fairs, literary festivals, performance poetry programs, poetry slams, etc., that are also giving the necessary impetus to American literature. American literature since the early 20th century, however, has been largely market driven. It is the market or the book publishing industry 
that defines American literature to a great extent. And this is since what we call the paperback revolution. Before I come to the paperback revolution, let me uh, share with you a quick overview of the major writers uh, of this mind boggling variety that I talked about. Yeah. First, the it is just by way of introduction, I'm telling you the wide variety of uh, writers in America, starting with the feminist LGBTQ and uh, gender activists who are also writers. As you know, gender activism, feminism, LGBTQ movement all started from America. We have a variety of writers which I have given here uh, in section E of this chapter who are all very prominent writers today and who have marked a big change, a paradigm shift in American literature. There are a lot of writers of this category, all of whom I cannot talk about here, but I'm sure you would be familiar with both writers and uh, theorists like Susan Sontag or Judith Butler or Alice Walker, etc. Gloria and Zeldwa, they're all theorists also. You must be familiar with the Stonewall riots that started the LGBTQ movement. There are also uh, fourth wave feminism, and fifth, uh, fifth wave feminism also some people talk about post-feminism. All these are also raging in America in literature as well as culture at this time. Come to think of the um, writers, Leslie Feenberg, uh, 1949 born writer, is one of the earliest uh, writers to express gay or lesbian uh, mentality. He performs gender in a masculine manner. So it's a, he's a woman, she's a woman, but performing gender in a masculine manner. This is called butch feminism. And uh, Leslie Fe Feenberg is also a gender activist and communist, uh, advocate for marginal people, marginal minority writers. The next writer you have here is Lou Sullivan. This is only an introduction. I have not come into uh, the main topic of my presentation at all. Lou Sullivan is also uh, a trans man uh, who traverses the gender binary. And uh, he is largely responsible for modern understanding of sexual orientation, being one of the first writers in America who came out uh, with a statement on gender and queer identity. A transvestite answers a feminist. That was one of his early works. And information for the female to male cross-dresser and transsexual. That is a, another recent work. These are all very major uh, landmarks in the landscape of American literature of the contemporary times. Now, this is Michael Cunningham. Many of you would have heard of him as a screenwriter. He wrote very powerful uh, works against uh, the establishment. And he's also the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning bestseller novel, The Hours, uh, which is based on Mrs. Dalloway. Michael Cunningham uh, is a writer who again falls in the LGBTQ category. Tony Kushner, uh, George Chauncey, Michael Shaban, these are also other important LGBTQ writers. They are uh, also people who have contributed immensely to this field, but I will be talking the, about them in another category later. Now, uh, Another group of writers within this category are the counterculture movement writers. The counterculture movement started, as you know, in the 1960s. And uh, we know that counterculture is a book, a theoretical work written by Theodore Rozak about the 1960s and later, when subcultures and countercultures like the hippies, Beatlemania, uh, the bikers, etc., flourished. Khalil Gibran, Kurt Vonnegut, Andy Warhol, many important writers are there like that. But I would like to bring your attention to Ken Casey and the Merry Pranksters, who uh, went around America 
in this school bus and he established, he started the LSD subculture, the lysergic acid, diethylamide is the drug that he found and he uh, popularized it. It was a very momentous uh, thing for the counterculture movement people uh, to explore psychedelic experience. This school bus, by the way, is called Further, Further. There are also other important writers like Hunter S. Thompson, Thomas Pynchon, Ed Santers, and our Bob Dylan in the counterculture movement category. I'm just introducing you, to you the landscape, as I told you, as I'm reminding you again. Then there are a lot of Asian American writers who are also very, very important because many of them are Indian. You might want to know their names, I'm sure. I have given their names here. A.K. Ramanujan, he was a professor in American universities. And as you know, he was a very major translator, poet, and folklorist. Uh, we usually study him under Indian literature because he wrote about India and less about America. Maxine Hong Kingston, sorry for the mistake. It is Hong Kingston. Maxine Hong Kingston is the author of Woman Warrior, Chinaman, Trip Master, Monkey, etc. Agha Shahid Ali, another Kashmiri Indian and American writer who is also a very major poet. And he talked about uh, biryanization, like chutnification. They all talked about immigrant experience a lot. Then there is Mina Alexander, again, poet, memoirist, and novelist. Amy Tan is Chinese. Her Joy Luck Club, where a group of women are playing the Mahjong game. That is a momentous novel, which is uh, widely prescribed in universities and widely read all over the world. Vijay Sheshadri is another Indian writer. Sujada Bhatt, Chitra Banerjee Divakarani, very familiar writer for all of us. Do not think I am just uh, going over the writer's names. It is I'm just introducing to you so that you will be, uh, be remembering all these names that you already know, I'm sure. There is David Henry Huang, who wrote M. Butterfly, which is a momentous play, uh, which uh, shows the relationship between a French diplomat and a Peking opera singer. M. Butterfly, that's another important work that is prescribed. Triti Umrigar is a novelist and nonfiction writer, born and raised in Mumbai, and came to the United States and became emerged as a writer there. Bombay Time is her early work. If Today Be Sweet, Everybody's Son, these are by Thirti Umrigar. Thirti actually, th this is a typo, T-H-R-I-T-Y, Thirti Umrigar. Shana Singh Baldwin is also a very important writer, but she is not fully American because she is also Canadian. She lives in uh, Can Canada and America. She has lived in Canada and America both. Uh, very important short stories and novels are there, including We Are Not in Pakistan, a short story collection. And The Tiger Claw, which is centered on the partition of India. So we can see one thing. Most of these Asian American writers are writing about their culture. Keep that in mind. And then there is our Khaled Hosseini, who is a very familiar figure and uh, the author of Kite Runner, uh, A Thousand Splendid Sons, both very important uh, novels. If Kite Runner is about two men or boys, uh, the other one, A Thousand Splendid Sons is about two women. Now there are also Chicano and Caribbean writers. Chicano and Caribbean writers uh, are not so familiar to us as the others. I already mentioned Gloria Anzaldua, Sandra Cisneros, who wrote the, How, uh, the House on Mango Street, and so many others like Hector Tobar, June Jordan, Justin Torres, etc. Caribbean writers in America are also familiar to us, starting from our uh, Claude McKay, there is Paul Marshall, Jamaica Kincaid, and others. So this is the melting pot of America where lots of majority of uh, writers, we can say, are people who have come from somewhere else. The white uh, writers in America are still a strong majority, including all these immigrants and also Native American writers. There is a formidable um, group of writers who have emerged in America uh, also.
Now, American literature today is largely mingled with popular fiction. In this Encyclopedia Volume 2, for example, where I'm talking about late 20th century and early 21st century literature, uh, this book is yet to be released. I'm just out of enthusiasm uh, make, writing, uh, delivering this presentation based on it. In this book, for example, uh, a lot of writers whom I have called literary writers are actually popular fiction writers. And uh, how do you draw the line between literature and popular fiction? How do you distinguish between these two? That is a tough challenge because uh, the line is very, very blurred and the distinction is ambivalent. There is also the debate whether it is necessary to talk about the distinction between popular fiction and literature at all. Anyway, this burgeoning of or this explosion of popular fiction happened. Uh, books reached us, books became accessible to us by what is called the paperback revolution. For that, to talk about the paperback revolution, I have to go back to the past, to the 1935 period, when uh, there was the first publication of the modern paperback books, when Penguin published their first paperback books, 10 of them under the leadership of Robert de Graaf. Robert de Graaf of Penguin uh, partnered with Simon and & Schuster, and in 1939, they began publishing pocket books or paperback books all over America. And these books, which happened to be, pub uh, you know, other publishers also joined in, they were some of them very good canonical novels, some of them nonfiction, some of them pulp fiction. And there were uh, only 500 bookstores in America before the paperback revolution. But now every grocery store, airport terminal, and even bookstore began selling novels in paperback. And in two years, uh, even before 1940 dawned, 17 million books were published. You can see the market for books in America. And there is no other way but for books to be market drawn, for literature to be market driven. Market is what decides the nature of American literature now. And they uh, joined with the magazine publishing industry and book publishing uh, became one of the biggest industries in America. So many of these books were, as I said, quality literature. I'm muting all of you for some time. Uh, many of these books were quality literature, but there was also a flood of what is called trash, trash or uh, popular fiction, fiction that caters to popular taste. And uh, by the 1950s, uh, this became uh, widespread all over the world. People began uh, writing more and more new genres were burgeoning at this time. Books became accessible to people. And very importantly, books became uh, personal. It became, this reading became subjective. You can sit in your room and read. So romances and what uh, Sandeep was calling guilty pleasures, it abounded. Uh, because of because of the personalization of reading, because of the subjectification of reading. And this paperback revolution connects modernism and postmodernism in both America and Europe. Age-old practices of reading and writing stopped and literary realism also gave way to experimentation. The uh, exhaustion of literary realism, that is what John Barth in a famous essay called Literature of Exhaustion. That is what he talked about. He talked about how uh, the age-old traditions of realism, all the established genres of literature are now exhausted. They are now used up. They don't exist anymore. And this Literature of Exhaustion essay by John Barth, 1967 essay, became a manifesto of postmodernism. The essay depicted uh, literary realism as a used up tradition. Naturally, it became very controversial. It was very provocative. Barth also said that literature uh, novel is dying. The literary novel is dying. He also said that. 
he said that the author in the postmodern period, this came to be called the postmodern period, literature of exhaustion, this essay by the American novelist John, John Barth, marks the beginning of postmodernism. And this, uh, in this essay, John Barth says that the author of the postmodern author is merely imitating the role of the traditional author. There is no author now. We are just copy pasting or we are just uh, repeating or recycling, not copy pasting literally necessarily, but copy pasting genres and styles. We are not having any original style. We are recycling. We are using the old things again and again. Uh, that uh, is the feature of mass production. When books became mass produced like this, like Walter Benjamin called it, books lost their aura and they became uh, mass recycled. So that is why he says the author's role is merely an imitation in the postmodern period. And postmodernism dawned with this. And postmodernism, as everybody knows, it draws upon modernism and uh, it is uh, uh, it, it is invested with a cynicism, a rebellion and irony. That is what I will talk about next. Irony in the modern and postmodern period. Uh, American literary culture in the first half of the 20th century saw irony emerging as a term to describe intersections between aesthetic and political uh, practices. The aesthetics of writing uh, clubbed with the political views of the authors, the political views that were required at that time, it gave rise to uh, an ironic kind of writing. Irony describes intersections between the aesthetic and political practices in American literature at this time. And uh, irony emerges from the disjuncture between experience and reality. We are experiencing something, but that is not what the government is saying. That is not the reality. Uh, for others, that disjuncture is what is called irony. In literary and popular cultures, irony is no longer a figure of speech, but it is a philosophy, a, a way to look at life and society. Many writers uh, have employed irony. There are romantic writers who employed irony, modernist writers as well as postmodern writers. There are some subtle differences between all this. I will come to that. But irony in the postmodern period became a very strong weapon in the hands of uh, modernist and postmodernist writers like uh, William Faulkner, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, Ralph Ellison, uh, John Dos Passos, uh, Tony Morrison, uh, Allen Ginsberg and the Beat writers, etc. All of them in the modernist and postmodernist period in the 20th century did not employ irony in the same manner. They did not employ modernism or postmodernism also in the same manner. It was very diverse and uh, everybody had a unique approach to life and society. In the Romantic period, uh, irony was a means of uh, showing that the author is confronting the realities. The author is a rebel. He's fighting against the realities like you see in uh, Byron's Don Juan or Matthew Arnold's poetry, or even uh, Wallace Stevens in American literature. They're all people, writers, who have stood up against the status quo, who have stood up in rebellion uh, against the establishment in many ways. That constitutes romantic irony. Modernist irony is also similar, but modernist irony is rooted in anarchy and disorder. And modernism uh, seeks to discover order in this immense panorama of futility and anarchy that is contemporary history. Modernism is an attempt to reorder the world as you see from the wasteland, as you see from Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner or any of the plays of Arthur Miller, All My Sons or uh, Death of a Salesman or The Glass Menagerie, Tennessee Williams. In all these works, uh, the narrator or the protagonist is uh, helpless. The protagonist is self-aware uh, in, a, in a metafictional manner and showing that uh, he is unable to stand up against the society. Look at Willie Lowman or the protagonist of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, for example. So in postmodern irony, uh, the world is seen as a fabrication of the author. It is not real. It is artificial. 
its characteristics its characters are constructs and uh, uh, the modernist postmodernist text is merely a reworking of earlier texts now let me recap what i said just now so that you will understand uh, i was saying that uh, in the early period in american literature during the before the time of the paperback there was realism but after the coming of the paperback modernism and postmodernism came in and they uh, broke with the realistic tradition and both modernism and postmodernism engaged in a certain irony or disjuncture or rebellion against the status quo or the mainstream society did you understand? That is the point that I made. And look at this. There are a, a plethora of postmodern writers who have done this. Uh, after I talk about these postmodern writers also, I will come to my topic, which is uh, guilty pleasures. I am opening the second volume of the American Encyclopedia, which is now being sent to all of you who have paid for it. This is an amazing book we have brought out, I am myself saying, because uh, in this book, this is like a dictionary, this is like an encyclopedia of world literature. This, this book is like an encyclopedia of contemporary world literature. That much information is there in this book. So we are going to talk about the postmodern writers, starting from Donald Barthelme. I don't remember. Uh, Donald Barthelme. Okay, he's a short story writer and he has written a very famous short story called uh, the short story Snow White. He is using that fairy tale, Snow White is a fairy tale as all of us know, to show how the uh, characters have to make compromises, how they have to change their expectations in order to survive in this world. To cut short, that is what the poem, uh, sorry, short story Snow White is about. Barthelme has also written so many other uh, stories that are very, very important and famous, like The Balloon, Kierkegaard, Unfair to Schlegel, Blue Bird, The Indian Uprising, etc. In all of these cases, you can see that the protagonists or the characters are uh, not believable. They are not realistic. They are standing up against uh, something and uh, the banality, the mundanity of life is defeating their purpose. The, the struggle for survival, as you saw in Snow White. That is what you see in most of these um, stories of Donald Barthelme. Then we also have a lot of other postmodern writers like Thomas Pynchon. Thomas Pynchon also wrote in a very esoteric manner. Uh, he used very unconventional styles of writing and it's very difficult to understand his works also. V, Gravity's Rainbow, The Crying of Lot 49. There are also uh, painter, painters like Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol is a very major postmodern painter who expressed the angst of postmodernism in the, in the phrase 15 minutes of fame. Andy Warhol has painted uh, soup cans and uh, our um, Marilyn Monroe, he has painted diamond dust shoes. These are all extremely important texts of postmodernism that show this uh, disjuncture or irony. Then there is Brett Easton Ellis, uh, who wrote a very satirical novel called American Psycho. Many of you might have watched the movie made of it. It has been uh, criticized also for being overtly violent and misogynistic. Such violence and uh, extreme um, misogyny, etc., are characteristic of postmodern disjuncture. Tony Kushner, as you know, uh, is a very important writer today. Angels in America, a gay fantasia, is his most famous work. It is the fantastical story narrating the uh, life of Prior Walter. He has AIDS. He is living in contemporary America and he is visited by an angel. Look at this. This is anti-realistic. This is not, uh, this does not have very similitude, postmodern literature. Postmodern literature is a rejection of uh, realism and our expectations. Tony Kushner also wrote a famous play. Uh, it might be important for your exams also. 
होम बॉडी बार कबूल होम बॉडी बार कबूल कबूल अफगानिस्तान कबूल दैट कबूल इट्स अ प्ले दैट टेल्स अ स्टोरी ऑफ अ लंडन हाउस वाइफ शी इज वेरी लोनली एंड शी इज कॉल शी इज होम बॉडी शी इज अब नॉर्मली ऑब्सेस्ड विथ अफगानिस्तान रिमेंबर दिस इज अटायर because america was abnormally obsessed with afghanistan america created all these problems in afghanistan and eventually leading to the bombing of uh, world trade center also so uh, that is what tony kushner is talking about in home body america now let me tell you about another very important american writer who many of you might have heard of uh, don delillo Don Delillo is a very contemporary writer whose novels are extremely important um starting from Americana a 1971 novel uh Ratna Star White Noise when you if you might have heard of Underworld because it is about waste management Underworld is about a waste management executive <laughs> and so contemporary uh but postmodern because many are very fantastic stories for example cosmopolis is the story of a man going through uh, going around new york in his limousine and it is comparable to james joyce's ulysses which novel cosmopolis by uh, don delillo in white noise which is the most fantastic of all these works you have uh, jack the protagonist who is abnormally afraid of death uh, so in all these works and, and and finally you know how he is overcome by uh, overcoming his fear of death when his own little son goes in a tricycle across the highway and does not get killed his own little boy uh, goes across the highway in a tricycle can you imagine the american highway and he does not get killed so post modern literature is one of exhaustion that means postmodern literature has rejected all the traditions that came before they are completely writing in a new experimental imaginative style that is unheard of before it is completely different from uh, any literature that went before and postmodern literature is also about guilty pleasures guilty pleasures uh, i got this uh, word i mean i knew that word but i associated it with postmodernism when i came across sorry when i came across a book but before we come to that la, let us do an activity uh, if you are interested you can tell me in the chat box um, what are your guilty pleasures now that is a very direct question oh my god you are thinking i i don't want to tell you that don't worry that is not what i mean in the contemporary times what are our guilty pleasures yes somebody is saying watching uh, trash movies uh somebody is saying eating too many junk food and pizzas i have given that here sometimes excessive shopping uh, ordering online food even though you don't really need it procrastinating putting things off not doing things on time binge watching reality shows the americans uh watch reality shows whereas indians watch web series so that okay so many of you are telling me uh the answers to these driving car at excessive speed indulging in all sorts isn't it yes midnight food waffles uh indulging in old songs very good also indulging in social media uh social media is also a guilty pleasure of the contemporary times there is nothing wrong with guilty pleasures uh why we have the word guilty pleasure is because we have the idea that there is some pleasure for which we don't have to feel guilty you know some pleasures are good you know like books in the school syllabus <laughs> when we make a school syllabus there are good books and bad books bad books should never get into the school syllabus isn't it like that some pleasures are good and some pleasures are bad do we really need to categorize them like that because even in the 19th century nostalgic nostalgically watching past uh, movies etc i have a friend who every day watches uh, he is almost 40 years old but every day he watches ye jawani hai diwani i don't know what crazy indulgence that is 
And he says, that is my past. <laughs> Why don't you live in the present and future? <laughs> so all of us have one or the other of these uh, guilty pleasures, taking selfies also very narcissistically. Now, I came across this book by Hugh McIntosh. Uh, Hugh, Hugh McIntosh wrote Guilty Pleasures, popular novels and American audiences in the long 19th century. So guilty pleasures uh, in reading is not something new because uh, even though it was punished when women read, uh, women especially read uh, bad books, even in the late 19th century, the idea was there that literature, popular literature, popular novels need not be so uh, moral, need not be so perfect. You can talk about naughty things in popular novels, only then they will sell. Okay, that we know in the age of internet also. When we put a, uh, you know, make a video for YouTube or Instagram, etc., how we title it, how tantalize, uh, tantalizing the title is, is important. Maybe that is why I titled my presentation also Guilty Pleasures and Exhaustion. So, as we all know, postmodernism is considered a culture of indulgence and shamelessness. In movies, there are the blockbuster CGI movies uh, of mass appeal, which have no uh, value in the traditional sense. They are just superficial and ridiculously action-packed. And crazy movies that are just a waste of time. It just past time movies. Uh, I have just written down some uh, here, Anaconda or Teenage Mutant Ninja or Bad Boys. Those are all movies that I would slap my son for watching. <laughs> and Bloodspot, Van Damme movie, Bloodspot. Do you remember? So much bloodshed. Sylvester Stallone's Rocky movies, Pretty Woman, then uh, Jaws 2, 3, etc. The first Jaws was kind of good, but the other later Jaws, even though it was Spielberg, uh, later Jaws were all so uh, sensational movies. So, as you know, these trends are copied in Bollywood also. I read about Bollywood uh, remakes of uh, you know Hollywood movies, and I found that there are hundred, uh, at least hundred Bollywood movies that are. Um, you know, that are remakes of Hollywood movies. There are so many uh, movies that uh, one of my uh, assistants, my, one of my team members also sent me, Alone in the Dark, Expendables, Max Steel, X-Men, all. Why are we watching them? We feel like The Last Days of American Crime, etc. There are uh, many movies that you can remember. Uh, can you think of Bollywood parallels? Type in the chat box. What are the Bollywood parallels of trash movies or guilty pleasure movies? Tell me in the chat box. Mm -hmm. I am thinking of uh, Varun Dhawan movies. In many of these movies, you should also know that there are there is kind of deliberately bad acting. Ah, zero. Oh my God. What a horrible movie that was, isn't it? <laughs> Fir Hera Firi. Okay, student of the year also, kind of, yeah. Rock on to uh, Jagga Jasus, Jab Harry met Sejal. This uh, Shahrukh Khan has started to specialize in these kind of movies, I think, <laughs> of late. Because that is a postmodern rebellion against the high movies, the high art. And uh, a lot of post-feminism and such theories are also uh, completely tied up in these uh, guilty pleasure discourses. There are, uh, you know, post-feminist mommy narratives and things like that also. So um, the indulgent spirit of postmodernism is what I um, indicate by guilty pleasures. Ah, uh, I I don't know if you'll agree, but I have I I myself wrote down Akshay Kumar's Khiladi. <laughs> now uh, our talk of guilty pleasures, as I told you. Uh, borders on what is right and what is wrong. Should we really distinguish between uh, good and bad? But one thing is for sure, um, postmodernism is also exhausted. We have reached a stage when 
we don't want to watch these movies anymore uh, every one of us would have had this experience of looking through netflix or prime videos or sony tv etc are what is this no movie to watch no good web series which will i watch they are all bad like that feeling we get sometimes so uh there is an exhaustion we have reached a stage when we don't want this anymore talk about exhaustion i have to also mention the communicative revolution as you as we all are aware postmodernism has witnessed the extraordinary saturation of social communication because of the growth of electronic media and communications technology uh this social media also many of us are leaving facebook nobody wants to look at facebook many of us have uninstalled instagram also what is that tiktok has become boring everything has become boring you understand so we want to migrate to some new form we want to leave this because it's exhausted it is boring already this shift uh is not only really of the genre it can also be of the style we are tired of this that is why we have excessive movies uh you know that make fun of all the attempts at expression like balaiya movies in telugu so many men reasonable men sensible men who are uh, excellent in every way in their life watch balaiya movies because of this exhaustion has any one of you watched balaiya movies atrocious movies there are like dinchak pooja's music <laughs> so uh, so many uh, ways in which we are um, exhausted and we are mocking at these uh, traditions we don't want even in you even in our english literature education it is the same many people are there who are very superficial and not ready to teach anything properly they don't they are not ready to learn somehow or the other copy paste culture has come even in in education in movies in religion you know a with chat gpt it is going to increase isn't it nobody will actually uh, do real hard work nobody wants to do we are all exhausted when i teach like this when i speak like this you are also feeling the same oh my god i am exhausted let me leave the session i don't want to listen to this anymore <laughs> isn't it i keep on giving content in every course that i run but all of you are thinking oh my god we are exhausted no more that is a post modern tendency that is a post i am you are my text okay i am talking about you here that is a post modern uh, tendency clear now uh, let us reflect on this you have to tell me in the chat box modernism was very esoteric esoteric means very Uh, difficult unique difficult to understand it was solipsistic that means narcissistic looking intro in inward not uh, connecting with anything like this modernism was post modernism is exhaustive and excessive modernism like this post modernism is too much both are too much what is the solution where do we stand how can we end this and democratize narratives is it possible to talk about literature where all of us are represented is it able to is it possible to talk about literature that is not exhaustive can realism be reconstructed without its limitations now you are wondering what are the limitations of realism i will tell you when realism came into being uh it aimed at a truthful reflection of life of everyday life of common man of the present moment isn't it realism wanted a truthful re representation of everyday life common man and this present moment etc but it fails because realism started uh manipulating truth when industrial revolution happened realism became a vehicle of the bourgeoisie the avant garde writers and artists and the modernists who emerged afterwards they rejected realism because um, realism had its problems now why did i ask you this question let us reflect on this is there something other than modernism and post modernism have you heard guys there is something called post post modernism 
earlier i talked about irony there is something called post irony against modernism and post modernism there is something called meta modernism meta modernism appeared in 1975 when one man called zawar zade i just found out from the internet i don't know this person he used to describe a cluster of literary techniques that emerged against both modernism and the post modernism okay so in this period of exhaustion there is a new technique called meta modernism all these are very ambivalent under defined theories they are not very widespread theories everybody is defining them in different ways so don't worry about it post irony also happened post irony is when sincerity and irony both are getting muddled are you sincere or are you ironic both are getting muddled did you understand it is a state of confusion dave eggers tao lin david foster wallace these are all writers associated with post irony and this post irony is associated with a movement a contemporary movement in american literature called new sincerity have you heard of that guys new sincerity new sincerity means a new uh, attention to sincerity and it is connected to meta modernism and post irony a tension between irony and sincerity leading to new sincerity in in uh, in, in 2002 the canadian uh, theorist linda hutchian do you know her poetics of post modernism politics of post modernism she wrote linda hutchian said that post modern moment has passed that's a very famous statement that she made the post modern moment has passed and she suggested that we need a post post modernism did you understand post post modernism is uh, we can also say hyper post modernism etc people are using all these words uh, a, 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 a feature of post modern or post post modern is also that we have too many terms too many definitions it is so confusing like technology and everything else terms are also developing more and more terms are developing in america and other places did you understand yeah uh, we can why can't we simply start over that also people are thinking there is a return to humanism also now uh, in many movies of the post ironic period instead of an artificial heroic avengers kind of world you see sentimental plots bad acting glorification of sex and drugs and very traditional conservative uh, kind of approaches you see uh, in movies and novels of this time post irony now before i go into that let us discuss what is common to contemporary forms of expression think about it and answer me diary style chiclet chiclet is a genre as you might know reality television personal vlogs what is common to all this tell me in your chat box somebody is saying personal touch somebody is saying they all seem like real both are correct both are correct that means you know uh, since i mentioned avengers movies avengers movies of course they are mindless entertainment lakshmi but listen to this now uh, avengers movies is deliberately artificial we know that it doesn't happen matrix or avengers or uh, say uh, terminator these are all deliberately artificial we know this is not real there is a mixing of the human and the post human there is a mixing of the real and the fantastic but there is a return in new sincerity to literature that is seemingly real that is personal where there is no heroism where there is vulnerability human beings are not heroes they have failings they have vulnerabilities they are struggling that trend is there uh, also in american literature now that is one of the main trends now uh, i i believe that this is analogous to the movies in bollywood uh, as 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 we have 
hero based movies on the one hand shahrukh khan and all the movies that we mentioned we also have pankaj pankaj kapoor na pankaj what is his name pankaj uh, and also rajkumar rao tripathi pankaj tripathi rajkumar rao their movies are so like real about personal of course they are also fiction but it is not the hero fiction it is not causing admiration it is not causing an awe it is not going beyond the human it is showing the failings of human beings the uh, anti heroic life of human beings the values the there is a return to humanism there did you understand yeah common man's everyday life yeah manoj bajpay nawaz nawazuddin siddiqui all of them all of them started in indian movies also this kind of a tradition a return to sen uh, sincerity a return to uh, authenticity of life a return to reality not realism like uh, but reality it is like uh, we are there because that is like reality television you understand those movies are like reality television actually people living those movies are like memoirs or diaries those movies have a personal touch i hope you get it that is what i am talking about as sincerity new sincerity it is called in american literature new sincerity is a social and artistic movement based on a philosophy of seriousness candor and authenticity irfan khan also but more than that uh, yeah all of them uh, you know the ordinary rural in malayalam movies in all movies of india this move is there new gen movies are there in malayalam movies also a lot of ordinary people who don't look very smart who are dark who are short who look like uh, us they are acting these days such movies are there so new sincerity in american let us say we don't have that word in india but it is interesting to compare these a seriousness about life and these people a candor candor means simplicity and a straightforwardness and an authenticity this is real that feeling it is a reaction to irony sarcasm cynicism and the artificial postmodern that we have been used to till now did you understand at the end of the 20th century it it abound it uh, uh, reached its zenith this artificial postmodern avatar and so many movies as well as novels where um, realism was reality was completely rejected new sincerity is a cultural movement where we have maximum fun and we are awesome but we are ordinary people not heroes not in the heroic sense of awesome but in the ordinary sense with our failings we are awesome did you understand i i hope you understand yeah uh, without irony without excessiveness it celebrates outsized the celebration of joy in all the movies that we talked about aishwarya gurana or irfan khan or uh, nawazuddin siddiqui etc there is celebration there is joy there is happiness there is achievement but without the artificial excesses rejecting irony particularly in american literature i am saying particularly an ironic appreciation of cultural products is not there it is a there is a genuine authenticity that is coming back i hope you understand this is the man who coined the term um, new sincerity david foster wallace this is the man i said i have not included in this encyclopedia but every other author is there in this amazing book <laughs> david foster wallace he always wore a bandana and he was an english professor uh now this is his most famous novel infinite jest i i uh, downloaded the kindle version of it for the sake of this lecture i was reading about i was reading this novel but oh my god thousand and uh, more than 1000 uh, pages it is so vast and it is such a uh, <laughs> an unreadable novel uh, the title infinite jest um comes from hamlet hamlet says yorick was a man of infinite jest this novel uh, by david foster wallace is a postmodern encyclopedic novel set in the future now it has the ingredients of a regular postmodern novel it is set in the future 
in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, uh, but it is treated in a different manner. It is not uh, the a usual postmodern novel. There are many interwoven narratives, uh, and one of the main narrative centers on a group of radical people from Quebec in Canada. They are called the wheelchair assassins. They are planning a violent geopolitical coup. Now, uh, there are two, um, two artistic movements in the 17th, 16th, 17th century, Renaissance and Mannerism. The difference between these two was very minimal. There was a lot of ambivalence. Renaissance in a slightly distorted manner is um, Mannerism. Like that, postmodernism and new sincerity, the difference is very slight. It is not very visible difference, but if you read David Foster Wallace, you will understand. It is difficult to read because it's a big and huge novel, my mind-boggling novel. But the characters are drawn in a very uh, simple and, uh, what can I say, human manner. There is sentimentality. There is uh, no artificiality and heroism. If you think of some web series, etc., you might be able to apply this there. If you read more, if you, you might be able to apply it there. This uh, authenticity, you know, there are, I, I, I don't remember all of them, but I've seen many web series where people are torn apart recent times. They are doing, trying to do big things, but they are torn apart by uh, their limitations. Uh, what is that web series where uh, an airplane is lost and many years later, 20 years later, it comes back and they are, uh, nobody knows, manifests. Yeah. Manifest. There, I think, um, this is there. They are like heroes in some sense, but they're not at all heroic. They're ordinary people. So that trend is uh, coming back. And this concept of new new um, sincerity is ambivalent and also very extensive. Uh, David Foster Wallace has written lots of essays based on it. He's a very important essay writer and he's prescribed in universities also. He uh, has written, uh, some of them have, do not have English titles, so it's difficult to read out. There are also other writers of uh, new sincerity. I, I have written here. Uh, Unibus plurum, <laughs> fictional futures and the conspicuously young. I tell you the truth. I have not read these essays. I have only read uh, maybe uh, 56 or 60 about pages of infinite jest. Uh, I did not want to talk about this without reading at all, but it is like a web series actually. Uh, but it is uh, something that is still evolving, even though David Foster Wallace committed suicide in 2008. He committed suicide. So there is hope that goes beyond the postmodern irony in these writers. Sorry, uh, I have to talk more about these writers. There is very famous, I should have put his picture, I forgot. Uh, Jonathan Franzen, who wrote The Corrections. That is also a very sprawling, big novel. That also I have read partly, like Infinite Jest, Huge family saga involving so many characters and somewhat like Amitav Ghosh's or Salman does these novels. So their uh, postmodernism is slowly giving way to a new kind of uh, writing. And I'm very happy about it. I was so fed up with postmodernism and its irony and excesses. But uh, this return of sincerity in whatever form it is, is seems like what is happening now so that is where i will end my um presentation let us have a discussion yeah feels like a healthy balance that is why uh, i wanted to talk about it because maybe we, we have not had a such a perception of american literature till now because we always stop with the early 20th century or some some writers like tony morrison etc we'll know from contemporary times so Jonathan Franzen, F-R-A-N-E-Z-E-N, who wrote The Corrections is a very famous award-winning book, Pulitzer Prize winning book. Jonathan Franzen's Corrections. I have the habit of buying all these books in Kindle and reading at least some pages. 
as you know i don't get time to read very much but i think uh, i i am passing the baton to you uh, so that at least you can read and oh yeah uh, american and uh, indian american and lgbtq have lot of scope thank you adya yeah yeah you can talk to me let us unmute everyone please speak in literature of exhaustion john barth is largely talking about uh, jorge luis borges i took a print out of that article and read it the literature of exhaustion can you see <laughs> yeah did you like the session i was from morning i was sitting and writing 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 and reading and not only morning other previous days also and i was so scared thinking i don't know enough i have to read more um i forgot to mention this when i talked about ken casey his motorcycle journey sorry not motorcycle a uh, school bus journey further remember that is the theme of uh tom wolfs electric cool acid kid famous book tom wolf is a new journalist new journalism tom wolf will you order this book before the pre booking runs out this will give you many writers from caribbean literature uh, and all those uh, periods the, all those unheard of writers they are asking these days here it is there or oh, you received it also did you like it i i it is not a perfect book there are many books that are there, there are many works that are still remaining to be added i'm sure but as it is it is a huge source of information ma'am we have a yes. question from anil if guilty pleasure doesn't involve guilt will it even be will it even remain pleasurable uh, uh guilty pleasure if it does not involve guilt <laughs> i know what you mean the pleasure is in the guilt eh it is based on your compartmentalization of what is right and wrong and no it that's very unhealthy it's like the forbidden fruit yeah Good evening, ma'am. I I I have no I no answer to that. I but I don't agree to it. Uh, tell me, please. Yeah, guilty pleasure is short term pleasure. Shifa said it. Thank you. Yeah, it is short term. We need the longer, la longer lasting pleasure of uh, the you know larger things are there, na. No? why you say that anil is also because of our mass product produced consumeristic culture where we want that short term i know i should not eat sweets but i am eating it that is consumerism that makes gives us this guilty pleasure it is not an essential aspect of human nature somebody was speaking please speak good evening ma'am uh yeah. first and foremost thank you so much uh for all the content i i just came across accidentally on youtube and since then i have just you know hooking on to you to your lectures and everything and earlier i was really panicked how will i crack but yes uh this time i'm sure i'll be able to crack net are you uh, listening to me the, for the first time uh like not uh, like live first time uh -huh. uh so my my question is like um uh, these days like you know motherhood uh, you know mothers also need like the me time 
so will that need time be considered as guilty pleasure or like you know it's a necessity for them because my mother used to work she used to uh, you know let she was answer, a government <laughs> so she said ki she never had a me time and i am like i need my me time whether i am a mother or a wife or uh, you know whatever so is that a guilty pleasure no that guilt is created in us by patriarchy uh you are a mother you should not have your own time your only purpose in life is to look after your child break it you don't need that kind of guilt no woman's uh life is 24 into 7 dedicated should be de dedicated for motherhood you should have me me time society will make you feel guilty again and again that is the backlash that is what susan faludi called a backlash uh society will make you feel guilty if you have me time your son will get less marks in the exam and then they will say ah oh, it's because the mother is not looking after him let him get less marks let him learn to uh, <laughs> fend for himself give him independence rather than spoon feed him <laughs> by cutting into your me time All right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, anyway, patriarchy gives us all these guilts. Right, right. Even what Anil said is the same. That guilt is what patriarchal mainstream society is giving us. As so as when you're feeling guilty and enjoying it, that means you don't dare. That means you 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 know you don't dare to say I don't need that law. I will break it. I don't care. I, it's my right to do what I want. My pleasure comes from that daring. I would rather have the pleasure of breaking the law because I believe it should be broken. I don't want guilty pleasure. The, that is the pleasure of a victim. That is the pleasure of a subjugated, weak, powerless person. what can you expect from post post modern genre all that we talked about is post post modern post irony new sincerity meta modernism all these are post post modern yeah uh assistant professor interview will you please watch kalyani wala the interview you can search in youtube there are two three videos we have made for assistant professor interviews will you please watch it i have said a lot of things there two two videos at least are there three videos i have made but one with other people one alone how to attend you assistant professor interview okay everybody you can watch it what are your guilty pleasures in american literature talking about books which i have not read <laughs> but i don't want to pretend that i read it i will tell you i did not read it because why i am i don't want to be forced into reading all these books by the system it is the system that makes us read all these things unnecessarily i have no interest in some of these works but i am forced to teach it system does not give us choice so we will dare to add water to quality <laughs> but i am trying to read more 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 all these encyclopedias will come with our reading and new summaries and everything may i read your books for upsc optional means so many people are already using these books for upsc optionals uh, one of two of my students have all, who actually studied with me have also passed also with these books you can you should anything else Yes, may the spirit of Ma Kali 
Durga, be filled in you. Break free from your shackles. Stand up, begin strong, and be yourself. Your life is not all about passing net or doing this particular job or you will try. If you can, you will pass. Hello, ma'am. If you get the job, you will do it. But even otherwise, you're amazing, strong and successful people. Remember that. Yes, Satya. Uh, ma'am, I'm actually new to all this. I'm pursuing undergraduation. I'm in third year now. So literature works are so vast. It like it ranges from poems to novels. Like I need to get past uh, net and JRF. How do I even comprehend all those? Because it will be from in MCK type, type, right? Which means I need to study each and every work. So it's uh, how to do it. Yeah. Where are you from? I'm from Karnataka. Yeah. Sandeep, <laughs> would you like to answer that question? Or Koyal, whoever is free. Or Princey. Here, yeah, we are live. Hold on, let me say, what is the literature? This is the answer. <laughs> Sorry, I was saying, I will answer. I was saying that uh, you should have an overview, a plan which we can give you if you want, and then cover uh, get a macro idea of all these authors, topics, movements, etc. Slowly go deep into the major authors and works. You are now in your third BA. You still have time. People are able to do it in six months or uh, eight months, etc. So you can just uh, study, start studying with the plan. Read as much as you can. Nobody is passing net after reading everything that is important. No problem. You can just... Uh, Study a lot of major works. You should know a lot about major authors. You should start in your BA itself. Improve your language skills and reading skills. And then you can do it. We have classes. Uh, if you want, uh, you know, for all kinds of people who have time, who don't have time, who have money, who don't have money. All kinds of people have courses at Valat. If you are interested, we can tell you about it if you contact us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, Ankita is saying there is a CUET PG course for undergraduates who are going to write the PG entrance. That course you can take, Satya, if you want. Yeah. Please don't think I'm trying to sell our courses. I'm just trying to help you and tell you what is happening here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ananya. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, what I understand research is as when we search again with the new lens and subjects that we're all familiar with, right? And it is always, always... <laughs> to so I'm so sorry. Uh, someone has uh, their mic open. Okay. So uh, I was saying that it is always enriching to understand literature with the fresh lens of literary theory and cultural studies and connecting it with our daily lives. I would like to thank our esteemed speaker, mentor, teacher, Dr. Kirlani Vallad, who is the managing director of uh, Vallad Education. And she is a living embodiment of all teaching theories. And she has beautifully interwoven the maxim of going from familiar, our guilty pleasures, to unfamiliar, right? And today she has done that in the context of contemporary American literature. Now we all are eagerly waiting for our copies of Contemporary Encyclopedia of America's Volume 2. After that amazing overview. I would also like to thank Team Vallad and CSRF for organizing this beautiful evening of learning and discussion. And I would like to thank our wonderful, wonderful audience and students who spend their precious time today with us. Happy Vijay Dashmi to you all.